Are there any questions? Premier, if, uh, first up, is this referendum tied in with the next state election or before then? No, I mean, it's unlikely to be dealt with any time soon. Obviously, we don't have the precondition, which is bipartisan support. But w what would be your preference to tie it in with the, when we go to the polls in 2018? Then it clearly becomes an election issue. You're yeah. either like no. for it or against it. No, because uh, obviously we'd have no chance of success at the moment. There's no point in promoting a referendum that has no chance of success. So there is no a broad community consensus uh, to take this step. I think what people need to know, though, is that um, if there is a discussion, ultimately something is not going to be imposed on them. They will have the ultimate opportunity to have a say. So it's too early to, to suggest as to a timeline as to when you actually want to Well, have I mean, this the first we'd have to work to restore bipartisanship because that's broken. Secondly, uh, we would have to have a debate which has developed to the extent where there is broad community support, so it would make sense to take the matter to a referendum. But what this, what this would be is a referendum at the end of the process, not at the beginning of the process. Something which, uh, where we'd worked through all of the issues and ultimately uh, we'd come to a conclusion we believe this was something that we should promote to the South Australian people. So is, is your feeling that this is not a looming dead duck because it seems that the broad opinion today, mm. whether it be within the media, whether it be within politics, Nick Xenophon or whatever, you don't think that that counts for any... Well, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's for the Liberal Party to shut it down or any one politician to shut it down. I think, I believe it's a matter that the South Australian community should continue to discuss and I suppose what I'm doing is framing up uh, what the process should be for that discussion. I think there are three points. It needs to be bipartisan. It needs to have broad community support, as reflected through a referendum, saying yes. And thirdly, a specific Aboriginal community affected should also say yes. But, but this, you're now turning it into an election issue. Well, it's a matter for the, the parties about how they'll deal well, with the, it. The but other side's flag their intent. Well, you, you, you are not backing off. So yeah. you, you are asking South Australians to vote you back in on the strength of a nuclear dump and if they want to vote the opposition in, the Liberal Party in, will be on the strength of not having one. It's as simple as that, isn't it? No, it's not as simple as that. And, and I think it insults the intelligence of the South Australian community to say it's as simple as that. Uh, because the, the truth is that this is a much more complex issue. Most people would accept that this requires a much deeper level of consent than just what I think, even what one particular political party thinks. It would require bipartisanship, and I say even further, I say it, it requires something even more than that. No, not even a politician or a party, but the whole of the South Australian community having their say. And that would uh, represent an established view, which also would be the sort of um, view that I think uh, an international company dealing with us would want to see. The further thing about it uh, is this, is that the the South Australian community are entitled to have these discussions and they're entitled to be treated with respect and they're entitled to have their politicians to allow them to have these discussions and I think it will give them greater confidence to know that at the end of the day if they decide they don't want it, it's entirely in their hands. Can you, to take up Mike's point, yeah. if you're not going to have a referendum before the next election, then surely the election is a quasi-referendum, isn't it? No, because, I mean, the, the, the precondition doesn't exist. There's no bipartisanship, so we simply won't be promoting a referendum unless there's bipartisanship. We always said this could only proceed on a bipartisan basis. So if there's no bipartisanship, there is no proposal. So, so if the referendum's the last step, yeah. what, what do you do between now and then? Do you wait for the Liberals to change their mind? Or are you well, the first to change the legislation in the Parliament that lets no. you spend more money and actually develop it? No, we, we have... Obviously, the legislation's already been changed to permit us to consult and there's obviously much to consult about, and that can continue. The first step is to try and restore bipartisanship. There's no doubt about that. And um, it's been a recent phenomenon, the, the breakdown in bipartisanship. Uh, so that becomes the first question uh, for the Liberal Party. If they maintain their position, then this thing goes no further, and there's nothing much more that the matter can be progressed. But remember where we've come from in the last 10 years. Uh, 10 years ago, there was very substantial opposition to this matter. Now we see surveys which say that people are open to discussing it. So 
What happens in another 10 years is another matter, but um, issues of this sort, as we saw with Finland, have a very long gestation. There's something like 38 years from go to woe in Finland. And um, I believe it's incumbent on politicians to intelligently raise difficult questions with the South Australian community and invite them to discuss them. And, you know, cheap, cheap political stunts where people opportunistically jump on things, I think, are going to be marked down. Premier, isn't, isn't the first step not so much the Liberal Party showing bipartisanship? You've got to get a, past a special state no, I Labor took, convention. No, I took this matter to my convention. I have permission. I mean, we there was a proposal about shutting this matter down in the way that Stephen but Marshall... You're, you're stalling what is and was a, a view of the convention that, correct me if I'm wrong, but they were hmm. expecting a quicker decision than this. No. Well, I think what... I think some people were frankly expecting a different outcome from the citizens jury. But uh, the, the, the truth is this. I went to a state convention. I took this issue to the South Australian State Convention and I won permission to continue this discussion. There were resolutions on the books which said that this matter should be closed down. Our party, our convention, gave me the permission to have this discussion. That's all we're asking for the but, Liberal but Party to do. wasn't that based on you, you, but, but you taking a proposal, or you making a position if there were to be a change in, in before the end of the year? That's right. Well, will you seek to change the party position to support? No, no, no. The the, the why position. Not, why, I mean, if you think the party supports that position. The, no, the the point is this: the, the the position that we have in the South Australian branch is to permit the discussion, uh, and that's all I'm asking to do. If we if we take the matter to a referendum, of course, the party in government, if it is in government we'll have to have a position at that referendum. There'll be a matter for the party at that time. So this could go on for years and years Of course and years. it could, as it always was going to. Even, even Commissioner Scarce, even Commissioner Scarce said in his report that this was going to be a 10-year proposition at minimum. But would you, would you concede that if you take, if, if we don't progress it to a referendum or a, a clear position by March 2018, it then becomes a clear election issue? Well, I think it will be a clear election issue in the sense that uh, Stephen Marshall uh, and uh, his party will be analysed for the way in which they've conducted themselves in relation to this matter. But beyond that, there'll be no nuclear waste facility proposal going to the next election because there's no bipartisanship. The thing, the where, thing falls. Where, there'll be no proposal. Where do you see... Uh the point in time where the Aboriginal veto comes in before yeah. a referendum? Or no, no, it, that's when we're talking about site selection. So, and the Royal Commissioner contemplates two things social consent and then essentially uh, what he calls community consent. Social consent he means is the broader community, community consent he means is the local community. And he always anticipated there'd be need to be some measurable way of ascertaining that. I've taken it a step further and said that there should be a right of veto for a local Aboriginal community about whether a facility of this sort should be on their lands. Uh, I think that pays respect, especially to some of those communities who have had an awful history uh, with the nuclear fuel cycle. I was, I was powerfully influenced by a meeting I had with a group of Aboriginal people, uh, I think just the other day, where many of them felt that they didn't want to have to refight this issue on their lands. And I wanted to give them clarity that uh, if they don't want it on their lands, it's something that will not be imposed. You remember, you've got to look at these things from their perspective. They see 97% of the community, and they see the capacity to override their concerns very easily. I wanted to make it clear to them their concerns will never be overridden by this government or by my party. But then do you just move it to a different site and see? Well, I mean, that obviously site selection always becomes an issue. If there's a broad community consent, just as there was in Finland, there were three sites that so, were considered. So it's not an Aboriginal veto over the proposal? Not of all sites. No, it's for their land. I mean, Aboriginal land. people speak for their own land and there are defined groups that have been identified. How do you win over those within your own party that have their concerns and have been very vocal with their concerns about this plan? Sure. Well, things change over time and maybe those concerns will never be altered. There are some people whose positions are fixed and will never alter. Other people uh, may change their positions. I mean, you know, over the, over the sweep of sort of history, the Labor Party's adopted different positions on a range of issues that were formerly regarded as articles of faith. Uh, whether this will be one of those is, is, uh, remains to be seen. But 
my responsibility as Premier of the State is to see an opportunity that I believe is in the best interests of the state and give it every prospect of being entertained and properly considered. That's why I'm not shutting down this conversation. It would be the easiest thing in the world for me to walk away at this start time, but I believe I owe it to the people of South Australia to let them make the decision, not have some politician you know, who you know, makes a phone call from overseas and decides that it's all over. What will you do to get bipartisanship on this? Well, reach out to uh, to those that make these decisions. Uh, obviously, we, uh, we we've done all we can. Um, there's a position now. I don't know how locked in it is. Presumably, it is locked in. Is that your view? Do you think it should happen? I mean, do you support do you support nuclear waste disposal in South Australia? Oh, for, from my perspective, I think it's something worth entertaining. My party, though, uh, hasn't altered its position. Our our party position remains the same. We we haven't changed our policy. What I have permission to do is to discuss it. The Royal Commission uh, explicitly said a referendum is not a very good way to judge popular consensus, and you've repeated that previously. Why, why are you now going against the recommendation? Well, you see what I have said. What I've said is that it tends to close down debate and truncate discussions. And when I was asked to rule it out, I refused to rule it out because I had in my mind that it ultimately may be part of the process. I didn't want to mention that at that early stage because obviously it would it would set off a particular debate. Um, but I suppose reflecting on the citizens' jury and seeing what's at the heart of their no, uh, it was trust. And, and th there's a degree of frustration. I went nowhere near this process. We chose the most arm's length organisation we could. I chose the most respected South Australian citizen I could, Kevin Scarce. And yet many people in the jury thought this was a government fit up. What that tells us is we've got a profound issue of trust. And it goes travels well beyond me and my government. And so I'm trying to find ways of restoring trust and faith in the political process. That's why I'm taking a risk with these issues. This is a risk. Of course it's a political risk. But it's also a risk to almost everything else I want to do to make South Australia great. If we cannot build a consensus around difficult issues, that's why uh, I want to put this in the hands of the people so they can say no and then that will be respected. Could this cost you your leadership, Premier? Um, Could this cost you your leadership? Um, the, uh, my leadership's secure. So it's a question for the... The whole thing's a risk, so that must mean... No, a risk I'm talking about leadership. the people. The people have to make a judgement about me. My party's secure, but I'm, I'm talking about the people of South Australia. This is a political risk. I'm sure there are some people that take every opportunity to make, uh, to make merry with this in the, in, and represent it in a particular way. Uh, I am trying to, to give South Australians the control of this issue. I mean, if you if you were genuinely about bipartisanship and yeah. you wanted a referendum, why not go to Stephen Marshall, sit down, come here together and present a plan for a referendum? Well, he said it's dead and buried. I mean, it obviously... But did you take this to him? <laughs> I think he made it pretty clear what his position is. I, I mean, I'm but happy but to read... But, I mean, on but, but, one hand you're asking for bipartisanship, but, but, on the other hand... But it's not, it's not realistic, go, though, is it? It, that's not realistic, is it, um, given his public statements? And, and secondly, uh, which he's doubled down on, and secondly, uh, th there is no doubt that in the current environment a uh, referendum would have no prospects of success. There's no point in promoting a referendum so it's not that really has... a serious proposal at all. Well, it is, because what it, it shows is a pathway forward for the further discussion of this issue. I could have easily come here and said it's all over. What I'm trying to do is to show is to make sense of what we learnt through the deliberative process. And I think we learnt an enormous amount. And I want to pay respect to that. I want to give this back to the people of South Australia to make their judgement. And I think there is uh, more people than not in South Australia that want the sensible discussion of this issue and other complex issues. And if this isn't our future, if this isn't a future for South Australia, then we need to talk about other futures. Um, we need an engaged citizenry that does involve themselves and people uh, by their tens of thousands participated in this process and I want to respect what they told me through this process. So we've already spent, uh, a lot of taxpayer money's already yeah. been spent on this. Sure. Do you risk spending more money on what effectively is this? No, most of the, obviously all the material is now being produced and I think most people regard the, the Royal Commission and the statewide consultation as uh, a very powerful contribution. That's where the lion's share of the money was spent. It now provides uh, some resource <coughs> that can then be used by the community to take their next steps. 
So what will you do on it in the next 18 months? Yeah. Just sit and wait for the, the Liberals? Or is it, I mean, is it in effect dropped, except there is this sort of one well, way prospect of a referendum? Well, th th there is, no, th I mean, what we're doing is there will still be the a public discussion of the issue. There will still be the a joint committee that's yet to report, uh, the advisory panel of the uh, uh, Nuclear Fuel Cycle Response Agency is yet to provide a further analysis of the second jury. So, and, and there will be people in this community that will continue to discuss the question. Uh, there is, um, of course, the, uh, the public discussion that will continue uh, on the other 12 recommendations that I'll be outlining a response to. And there's some <coughs> exciting ideas in both mining and nuclear medicine that arises out of that. So. There are plenty of things to talk about. It seems like some of the scepticism within the jury was the lack of a developed you know, business plan, no customer, you know, yeah. no site, all the rest of it. How, how can you get to a point of any sort of political consensus without that work being done? And it sounds like you don't intend to do that, so doesn't it? Isn't it, well, isn't look, it uh, look, I think I think that's a good question. Um, th there is no doubt, though, that we can't really progress the matter to the next stage without bipartisanship. So if we're going to put this back together again, the first step is bipartisanship, and we don't have that at the moment. Is it too big for a state government? I mean, there was, there's no trust in the state, state government to pull it off, or the previous Liberal government or the previous yeah. government. Is it something well, that might the federal government needs to take on? That, that may be another question people want to ask and propose. Uh, they're the sorts of things that can be asked if the discussion continues. Uh, that's why I think the discussion should continue. Do, is there any chance this could just stall and, and remain chill for the rest of every lifetime in this room, that it just goes nowhere? It's possible, um, but uh, it's something that I believe I was duty-bound to explore, given the fact that we have about a quarter of the world's uranium and that we're already involved in the nuclear fuel cycle. And uh, uh, also, uh, the findings, I know they're disputed, but the findings by Kevin Scarce that uh, this represents uh, uh, over a hundred billion dollars of revenue to the South Australian so economy. So that could be almost a, a politically honourable discharge for everyone, that just nothing happens and we all just well, let it... Well, I don't think I would have raised this if I wasn't serious about it, Mike. You're maintaining funding for the agency? Yes. Um, so next year, in the state budget, there'll be funding going forward? Well, it won't obviously be funded at the same level. I mean, the, the lion's share of the funding was really about the Royal Commission that reaching out to 100 communities uh, and obviously the citizens' jury, so uh, we're expecting to be a, a much smaller operation. And without it, what's the, what's the big plan for the state? Without, without well, the... we've got a big plan. There are 10 economic priorities, and I'm happy to run you through every one of them. And, and they're all exciting, uh, and they're all making a massive difference to the state of South Australia. And just in the last 12 months, 9,000 jobs created. Uh, the fastest growth in hours worked of any state in the nation, 800,000 uh, since the same time last year. So there is change occurring in the South Australian economy. We always said this was a very long-term proposition. We never said it was about meeting the short or medium-term needs of the South Australian economy. And uh, uh, we um, are going to continue to pursue those matters and they're front and centre in our daily thinking. In terms of... Um re-establishing bipartisan support. Have yeah. you given any thought to going to the federal government? To I briefed the federal the government uh, on this matter last uh, Tuesday. I met um, uh, a number of ministers and briefed them on the, the process. Is there any prospect on the coalition leaning on Stephen Martin? Well, look, I, I don't know what uh, happens inside the Liberal Party. I'm, I'm confused. I, I thought... Uh, I, had to go to a, I had to go to a convention. Stephen Marshall seems to have been able to make a call from a uh, from a uh, lounge in Dubai and then um, and then get up and do a press conference. I don't quite know how it works over there. So if, if the position doesn't change between now and the next election, yeah. do you think voters might be a bit confused about what the Labor Party's view is on a nuclear waste dump? No, I, I think uh, they know that uh, we think the discussion should continue and that ultimately it should be decided by the people. It's not, uh, uh, it's not very difficult to follow. We see a, an opportunity for South Australia. Uh, we believe it should be discussed, but the people should decide. They're, this, they're the simple things, and so people should be able to participate in that discussion in the sure and certain knowledge that if they don't want it to happen, it won't happen. Well, the cynics would say that, uh, there's any cynics in this room, but they would say that perhaps you are trying to play politics with this, put this back on Stephen Marshall and have everyone talking about this rather than jobs, uh, and employment, no, I'd, cost of living, I, I would, I'd, love to, I'd love to talk about 
the 9,000 jobs that we created. Uh, and no, I was serious about this, and uh, I think it's an important issue to discuss. Uh, I, um, uh, I'm disappointed the Liberal Party have shifted their position at the 11th hour. Remembering, of course, that uh, the citizen's jury element of the process is something that Stephen Marshall criticised, and yet it obviously influenced his decision to, uh, to change his position. So I, I don't quite understand that chain of reasoning, uh, what motivates it, but um, obviously things change in politics and we'll see what, what happens. Do you think the citizen's jury was the informed um, popular opinion you're actually seeking to get, or do you think it was actually fundamentally broken in the way it was structured and I think biased towards an outcome? I th well, I mean, it was, it was said that it was biased towards a yes. That was what the opponents of it said. Now, some people are saying it's biased towards a no. I think the, um, the reality of the second citizen's jury is that gave us a little bit of a microcosm of what probably would have happened in a broader debate. Just the difference between a broader debate with a referendum is you never actually get to find out what was on the minds of people when they voted a la Brexit without any capacity to deal with them. I think we've learned something very important through the citizen's jury process. Was it messy? Was it 100%? Probably not. Uh, but I think we learned some pretty fundamental things. You know, it was a two-thirds result. It wasn't a 51, you know, 49 result. So there were some deep-seated concerns and, and they do reside around trust. And I'm trying to get in sync with that, pay respect to the 4,000 people that told me that they wanted to continue, and, you know, the, the 1.7 million people whose futures depend on this. And the only way forward I could see was going to them with a referendum and letting the people decide, not politicians, not political parties. Thank you.